Um, today I'm presenting uh, a combination of uh, three therapeutic approaches uh, for the treatment of uh, melanoma. Um, melanoma is, uh, melanoma is defined, defined as uh, one of the most lethal of the skin cancer. Its incidence uh, is rising faster than any other solid tumor. Um, the um, therapeutic uh, approaches uh, currently used uh, in uh, the clinic, uh, such as BRAF targeted therapy and immunotherapy, offer only partial solution to the problem. So we hypothesize the combination of a, a dendritic cell targeted nanovaccine together with uh, an anti-PD-1 uh, immunocheckpoint uh, modulator already in clinical use for the um, suppression, the immunosuppression blockade together with uh, an anti-OX40, an agonist of the immune system uh, for the stimulation of the T cells, together with uh, the myeloid array suppressor cells inhibitor, will offer, uh, will um, have a better outcome uh, for the treatment of uh, melanoma. For this purpose, we um, develop a nanoscale um, PLGA-based nanoparticle, and uh, these nanoparticles uh, are able to encapsulate, encapsulate melanin mart one peptide, uh, which is an antigen for melanoma, together with uh, other immunostimulator uh, component. These nanoparticles are decorated on the surface with mannose for the active targeting to the dendritic cells. The nanoparticles have an average size of 170 nanometer, a slightly um, rough surface, a neutral zeta potential and high encapsulation efficiency and loading capacity for uh, the melanin mart uh, peptides. When we use this nanoparticle in combination with uh, the immunocheckpoint modulator and the myeloid-derived suppressive cells inhibitor in a murin rat melanoma model, uh, the combination is able to induce uh, a, a strong inhibition of the tumor growth, uh, which is reflected also in the prolonged survival. So for uh, further discussion, come to my poster number six. Now, Dr. Adva Kaczynski, and the next one will be Eilam. Kaczynski. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Adva from the laboratory of Ronit, and I would like to present you my project dealing with the development of polymeric nanocarriers for oligonucleotides. This project aims to exploit an endogenous mechanism in which double strands of oligonucleotides silence genes expression via a process called RNA interference. This process has an immense potential in cancer therapy due to its ability to silence known oncogenes. However, in order for it to be exploited, several drawbacks need to be addressed. This is mainly by the introduction of a nanocarrier that will protect the siRNA via the bloodstream. For this purpose, we have developed a polymer based on polyglutamic acid backbone, further modified with amine groups and with hexyl groups. We hypothesize this polymer will self-assemble with siRNA to form a round-shaped particle. The two solutions were mixed via a microfluidic chip to maintain reproducibility in preparation. Indeed, we have watched by electron microscopy the formation of micellar-like structures bearing a diameter of around 50 nanometers. Our polyplexes were further characterized to internalize into cancer cells, as shown in red, and induce their gene silencing. In addition, our polyplexes were non-toxic to red blood cells and selectively accumulated in tumors when intravenously administered to mice. To conclude our project so far, our polyplexes composed of PGA amine polymers and siRNA were evaluated for their anti-cancer efficacy in several tumor models in which they were shown to reduce tumor growth and prolong the survival of tumor-bearing mice. For further details, please come and visit me on poster number seven. Thank you for listening. Very nice. Double applause. Uh, okay, and the next one after this will be Roy Cohen from the Beach Pizza Club. Oh, yeah? Yeah, after. What? I'm waiting that, no, I'm waiting that he will start, he will put the presentation. And the next one that can repair himself. 
Okay. Hello, everybody. Today I'm going to present my project, which focuses on glioblastoma and the brain microenvironment. So glioblastoma is the most common and lethal type of brain cancer with a median survival of under 15 months. This is with the current treatments, which include surgical resection, followed by chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And still little is known about glioblastoma and their interactions with the brain microenvironment. So for the brain microenvironment, we focused here on microglia, which are the brain immune cells. To do that, we use labeled glioblastoma cells and microglia cells, and we culture them in a 2D or 3D co-culture methods and follow for proliferation, invasion, and cytokine secretion. So first, we found that microglia enhance the proliferation and invasion of glioblastoma cells. Then, in the cytokine array, we found few cytokines to be overexpressed when co-culture the two cell types. So we prepared tumor spheroids containing both cell types seeded in matrigel, and by using an inhibitor for specific cytokines, we were able to inhibit the invasion of glioblastoma cells. Now, since our inhibitor is an hydrophobic spawn molecule, we decided to use our PGA-based amphiphilic nanoparticles to entrap the drug. Our nanoparticles have a micellar mycel structure with a pegylated hydrophilic surface and an hydrophobic core which contain the drug. It is synthesized by four steps preparation using a microfluidic chamber. We have a high concentration of the drug in the nanoparticles, a size of 40 nanometers, and a very low polydispersity. So we turn back to our spheres, and we show that our nanoparticles retain the activity of the inhibitor, while the empty nanoparticles had no effect. For more details, please visit me in my poster. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, next one, we have Roy Cohen. And the next one will be Basama. Basama. Huh? So hello, everybody. My name is Roy, and I'm from the Vich Prince Axle. I'm presenting a poster about my project, which focuses on the organization of uh, cells in the inner ear. Now, what we're looking at is the mammalian ear, and specifically this uh, spiral-shaped organ called the cochlea. Now, inside of the cochlea, you'll find a single layer of the epithelium called the organ of corti, which is essentially the sensory uh, organ for hearing in the ear. Now, the blue cells you see in the schematic are called hair cells. They are the sensory cells in this tissue. And we are interested in the pattern. So you can see they form a really precise pattern of three outer rows plus one inner row. And you can also see it in this image taken from a confocal microscope. Now, our question is, how does this pattern form during embryonic development? Now, in these images you can see, now in the left image, you can see uh, this tissue in an early stage of development, an undeveloped tissue. And during time, this, this, the tissue differentiates and reorganizes into its final form. Now, as I said, we want to study how it happens, uh, from the specifically from the mechanical point of view. And we do it, do it by uh, taking images and movies from different time points along the development. Now, we've already shown, for example, that in early developmental stages, uh, shear and conversion of forces drive the system into its organized state, and we also implemented it in a model. So we developed a <coughs> mechanical model that simulates this organization. And basically, the main idea, uh, the general idea is similar to the principles in a system of atoms crystallizing under pressure. So if you want to hear more, I'm in poster 11. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you very much. Now we will have Basma, right? And after that, we'll have uh, Shani from uh, Ronit's group. Ronit's group. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening for everyone. I am Basma Hamaise, a PhD student from the Vidish Prinzak lab, the biochemistry department. Uh, today I will talk briefly about my research on cell-cell communication, specifically from not signaling pathway. 
Notch signaling pathway is a highly conserved pathway that controls cell differentiation during the development of a multicellular organism. It takes a place in many developmental processes, such as the formation of blood vessels, the formation of muscles, also in the development of the inner ear. Notch signaling pathway is used by the interaction between notch receptor on one cell with the ligand in the neighborhood cells. This interaction leads to the cleavage of the notch receptors, which leads to release of the notch ICD to the nucleus as a transcription factor. And the rest of the notch receptor, which is the extracellular domain, which is bound to the ligand, undergoes endostosis in the sender cells in a process called transendostosis. This process is mediated by ubiquitination. So there is two factors that govern this pathway. The receptors ligand affinity, and the second one is ubiquitination. In my project, I'm trying to understand whether there is an interplay between two, the two factors, the ubiquitination and affinity. In fact, I am trying to understand whether high affinity can compensate for the role of ubiquitination. In order to do that, I am using a cell culture, biochemical techniques, and microscopy and imaging. Here we can see an example of the interaction between north cells in green and delta cells, which is lying in, in red, and we can see the interaction transcendistosis by yellow dots. If you are uh, interested to hear more about my posters and my project, you are welcome to visit me in poster number 12. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Now we'll have uh, Shani, and after Shani we'll have Jana Epstein. So today I will present to you my project. We are aiming to design a targeted nanomedicine design for the entrapment of BRF and MAC inhibitors for the treatment of melanoma. Uh, the BRF is a, MAC is a BRF inhibitor and tomatinib is a MAC inhibitors. Um, and they are the standard treatment of care for patients with BRF mutated melanoma. Uh, their combination demonstrated longer progression-free survival and overall survival compared to monotherapy and to chemotherapy. Um, however, the response duration is limited due to required resistance. Moreover, adverse events arising from the systemic administration, aspirexia, and decreased ejection fraction can cause dosing, interruptions, or discontinuation. Therefore, we suggest a nanoparticle uh, system that will deliver the two drugs together simultaneously to the uh, cancer site and enhance their synergistic effect and may hinder the ability of the cancer cells to develop escape mechanisms. Uh, moreover, SP selectin was shown to be overexpressed on activated endothelial cells and tumor cells. Uh, our PLG nanoparticles will be modified to target P selectin and enhance their accumulation on these two compartments. Uh, we, did, we developed a microfluidic method to uh, prepare these PLG nanoparticles. They are about 100 nanometers. They have low, low polydispersity index and they have a synergistic drug loading. Our um, combined nanoparticles showed uh, preferred efficacy compared to monotherapy. Um, they um, inhibit the, sp uh, the sprouting of our multicellular um, spheroid models. They were biocompatible, they did not cause red blood cell lysis, and following IV administration, they accumulated into tumors. Thank you, and you can meet me at poster 13. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we'll have uh, Jana Epstein, and after this, we will have Sabina. But wow, you know the order better than me. Okay, hi. Uh, um, I would like to present uh, um, uh, our project that is focuses on uh, thread based uh, turn on fluorescent nanopores for image guided surgery of cancer. Uh, our uh, rationale was to design uh, the probe that will assist surgeons during tumor excision process 
to balance between coupling tumor uh, removal, uh, leaving no residual disease, and reducing, uh, reducing uh, damage uh, of the surrounding healthy tissues. Uh, to that uh, end, we designed and synthesized two turn-on uh, near-IR polymeric probes that are fluorescently quenched while traveling the body thanks to uh, self-quenching or freight interactions between densely packed fluorophore molecules and are activated to the turn-on state by catepsin that are uh, known to be overexpressed in many tumors, uh, in many tumor types. This activation is getting possible due to enzymatic degradation of the, um, of the <clears throat> biodegradable uh, polyglutamic acid bed bond, which release the fluorophores to regenerate the fluorescence. Uh, yeah, forgot it. We characterized our probes and found they to be suitable to exploit an EPR effect uh, for better internalization and retention uh, in the tumor. Um, the fluorescent signal of the probe was quenched until it's activated by catepsin B, uh, uh, sorry, uh, by catepsin B uh, in, uh, that uh, was introduced to it. And in addition, we showed the probe's uh, internalization and the uh, colocalization with lysosome inside the tumor cells. Eventually, we showed the ability of our probe clearly delineate tumor uh, boundaries during image-guided surgery. And for more information, please uh, come uh, to my poster number 14. Uh, now Sabina, and after this we'll have Maus Miriti and Dan Paris Group. Probably I'm saying the name wrong. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone, and thank you for uh, letting me present my project. Today I'm going to talk about melanoma, and uh, that which is the most lethal uh, skin cancer, not because uh, the primary itself, but because of second lesion, especially to the brain. Uh, the brain microenvironment, and we decided to focus mainly on uh, astrocytes, are uh, protecting and keeping the homeostasis of the brain. But then, when we have uh, during a tumor progression, the primary lesion is inv invading the local tissue, uh, intravasating, secreting uh, pro inflammatory cytokines that in turn are activating the astrocytes and that are mediating a neuroinflammation uh, response, and in, uh, in this way, they are preparing the metastatic niche for the melanoma. At this purpose, we decided to target specific cytokines secreted from uh, the activated astrocytes using uh, SRNA we, um, with the delivery of, uh, based on uh, nanocarrier um, of polyethylene mean and amphiphilic aminated, aminated polyglutamate. And as you can see, we um, uh, achieve um, a complexation between the SRNA and the polymer and the uh, internalization within 24 hours. Moreover, we were able to uh, treat uh, the astrocytes and we, uh, we, we achieved uh, inhibition of uh, the mRNA expression uh, and the secretion of the specific cytokines. And uh, moreover, when we treated the melanoma with the conditioned media of pretreated astrocytes with sRNA or uh, a specific inhibitor for uh, the specific cytokines, we achieved uh, reduced uh, migration and um, uh, invasion. Um, so all these finding, findings are leading us for further in vivo and in vitro studies. Thank you for listening and come to see my poster number 15. So now we'll have Dr. Manu Smiriti, right? Yes. I hope. Okay. And the last one will be Dr. Shira Shaham. Shalom, I'm Manu in uh, Professor Dan Perry's lab. I'm doing postdoc, and the title of my project is Spheroid Implants as an Alternative Platform for Testing Anti-Tumor Therapeutics. 
So normally, we, uh, the, the tumor cells in lab are grown as two-dimensional, uh, in two-dimensional cell culture. And uh, so when these cells are injected in mice, they grow in all directions and they are all exposed to the same amount of nutrients and oxygen. So they are basically homogeneous set of cells. So the 3D spheroids or tumoroids are known for decades and they have been used as uh, testing platforms in vitro. And these represent different heterogeneous uh, mass of cells because the, uh, the inside cells are more hypoxic and are, have uh, exposure to less nutrients as compared to the 2D cells. So here what we've tried to do, we tried to develop a 3D in vivo testing platform. So this is how a 3D spheroid looks like. They, are, they grow as one unit. You can't differentiate between a single cell. Like you can't make out there is a single cell separately. And we implanted them in mice with very uh, easy method. And after, so these are two different cell lines we tested and we took one of them and the work flow was this, we uh, injected the mice with 2D or 3D tumors and then tested different class of therapies. So for chemotherapy, we, would, we took doxorubicin, liposome, uh, we took doxil, which is the uh, formulation from doxorubicin, and as a biological therapy, we took avastin. We then checked the in vivo tumor growth kinetics, and separately, we also are trying to characterize the 2D and 3D tumors uh, in their histopathology. So these are the in vivo results, which I can discuss <coughs> later. But the most intriguing results were uh, extremely good results with doxil alone or with avastin in the 3D tumors. So you can see that in general, the doxil works better than... Okay, so... <laughs> so. Thank you very much. Last one. Dr. Shira Sham Niv. Shacham, Shacham. Shacham, Shacham. Some of the baby before dinner. Great. Okay. So my name is Shira Shacham Niv, and I'm presenting the work entitled Apoptosis Inducing Non-Fibular Assemblies Imply a Common Mechanism for Inborn Error Metabolism Disorders. So, uh, over the past decade in the Gazette Lab, we were interested in trying to find the minimalistic amyloidogenic building block, starting from a full length protein moving to exopeptide, d-peptide, and then discovering that just a single metabolite can serve assemble and form these nano uh, fibers. And this work was done by Dr. Liad Leroborimovich that discovered that phenylalanine by itself can serve assemble and form these uh, toxic nano assemblies. Um, and interest, interestingly, phenylalanine accumulates in inborn error of metabolism disorder uh, called phenylcatenuria. And we were interested to see whether there are other metabolites that can self-assemble and form these uh, nano-assemblies. And of course the question is, yeah. And we established a new term called uh, metabolite amyloid, showing the ability of these metabolites to self-assemble and form these fibular uh, assemblies uh, to trigger uh, apoptosis, to the formation be inhibited by polyphenolic compounds, their immunological properties, their autofluorescence properties, and their ability to interact with modern membrane. So this is, the, this is just a short preview of some of the results. So you can see here the nano fibular uh, assemblies and their ability to bind the melodogenic uh, dyes. And you can see here the autofluorescence and the ability to use that to track them down and detect them in live cell imaging. So, so this work was done during my PhD and my postdoc at Eut Gazit Lab, and I've just joined the managing team of the Blavatnik Center for Drug Discovery to establish and be the head of the new Metabolite Medicine Division. So if you're interested in the research or in the new division, you can join me in poster 38. Thank you very much for all the presenters, and uh, I highly encourage everyone to go to see the posters before dinner, during dinner, and after dinner. Uh, and now I guess uh, we have uh, dinner time, right? So thank you and uh, enjoy dinner. <laughs>